my friends, it is Christmas Day, and soon it will be Christmas past. Soon we'll have the ghost of Christmas past, and 2013 will be a memory on into the fray. Let loose the dogs of war and cry havoc, as Shakespeare said. We'll be into 2014, really the most important year in my lifetime, and probably in the last century, where the battle to stop corporate world government will, will basically take place. That's why, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide, uh, under the guise of liberalism, we see the new authoritarianism of political correctness uh, that is now going after free speech across the board. You know, back in May of this year, we talked to uh, the iconic uh, creator of Beavis and Butthead, King of the Hill, um, so many other big films uh, like Extract and, of course, uh, Idiocracy, Mike Judge, who's been a longtime listener of the show. Rick Linkletter, the director, told me a decade ago that Mike Judge was a fan of the show, and I finally had a chance to meet him and hang out with him quite a bit. We're friends now. Uh, he's in Austinite. He's only here part of the time. He's so busy in TV and movie production out in Los Angeles where he lives most of the time. We had a chance to go to his home and really do a behind-the-scenes, in-depth interview with this very private man that, that does not do a lot of interviews and doesn't do in-depth ones. Uh, so I find myself really lucky to get to talk to Mike Judge. And on and off air, he talked about being afraid, but still challenging. And he put out a cartoon about a more conservative family. And even though it had high ratings, they canceled it. Uh, that came out uh, just a few years ago that would have been as big a hit as King of the Hill. It's one of the most successful TV franchises ever. And even that has more of a libertarian type conservative view. Uh, he said that you know he's afraid to even talk about the Tea Party because they might audit him or shut his shows down. And you've now seen that with Duck Dynasty and the censorship going uh, on there. And whether you agree with libertarian or conservative ideas, and I know with Mike Judge, it's really a libertarian deal. He's liberal on some issues like I am, uh, classically liberal, kind of like Thomas Jefferson, not the authoritarian liberal, uh, that he's really concerned about the censorship and really left-wing McCarthyism uh, that's going on in this country. And Camille Paglia uh, has called it, uh, you know, the great historian and philosopher and writer Camille Paglia has called it uh, fascist and uh, ultra-Stalinistic. You can say, well, one's fascist, one's communist. How are they similar? They're all authoritarian, autocratic. They go after free speech. So here is this in-depth interview that did go viral, but not as viral as it should have. I mean, this this is really a powerful interview, and Mike told me it's one of his favorite interviews ever, if not his favorite. Uh, so um, we dubbed this Beavis and Butthead Save the World documentary with Mike Judge. And again, enjoy the rest of the Christmas day. We appreciate you spending it uh, here with us Christmas evening and hope you've had a, a very uh, happy and um, fun and jolly uh, Christmas. There, I've committed another thought crime. researchers have found children who live in high fluoride areas have significantly lower IQs. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. Hello, this is Hank Hill. And I'm telling you what, you need to listen to Alex Jones. Researchers found members of Congress, on average, speak at a 10th grade level. Most Americans read at an 8th or 9th grade level. Look, now, I'll talk slow so as you can understand me. It was just a few thousand years ago that our ancestors were using primitive grunts to communicate. <laughs> Internal investigation that shows the agency targeted the Tea Party and conservative groups. That does scare me. I think I'm just going to make sure to not use the words Tea Party or Constitution in any of my work. All right, who are you? CIA, FBI, ATF? While gun ownership is at an all time high, crime is down. No one will be able to be armed. We're yes. going to take all the weapons. The Alex Jones Show, because there is a war on for your mind. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel Castro took the guns. Hugo Chavez took the guns. And if you try to take our guns, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. The answer to 1984 is 1776. Yeah, yeah. Infoworth.com. Yeah. <laughs> Judge, what is the secret of the universe? <laughs> the secret of the universe? Damn. That's a good one to start with. <laughs> Breakfast tacos. <laughs> well, I'm counting 37 health violations. I don't have an answer. <laughs>
I'd wanted to go into comedy for a long time, like sketch comedy and stuff, because I always did imitations and things like that. And, but anytime I'd try to pair up with someone, because you need other people to do that. You can't do that by yourself. And I had a friend in high school, just like brilliant, like funny guy. And I'd go, OK, just do that imitation of James Sanchez that you do. And we'll do. And he's like, oh, but no one knows who he is. And I was like, it doesn't matter. It's funny, you know. And, so yeah, I was trying to do stuff that would just like make my friends laugh, making my, like my brother laugh, my friend, that, that kind of stuff is how I was thinking of it. And, and I always had a hunch that that would work. And then- Do you think you influenced South Park? I think so. I mean, Trey and Matt have said that and uh, they're, they're, they've been really nice about that. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's just genius, all the stuff they do, you know. Stupid Toilet Safety Administration. Shoes off, belts off, sharp objects go in the plastic tray. This is inhumane. Shut up, sir. I wanted to do animation since I was a little kid. I mean, uh, I didn't think of it as a career so much as just something, because that wasn't ever described as, I mean, my mom especially, it was all about, you know, science. That's where it's at. Which I was, and I was kind of good at math and science, so. But animation was my burning desire. I actually kind of hit a fork in the road when I was, I don't know, remember how old I was. I'd saved up money from a summer job, and I, I had a paper out, and I was gonna either buy a, like a 16 millimeter camera that single framed, or I was gonna buy, then I decided, okay, I could buy a base, an electric base. And then I started looking at the price of film, and I was like, you know what, that's just, not possible, and the bass was gonna give me a social life if I could be in a band or something, so. <laughs> then I didn't start doing animation until I was like 26, really, so. And when I just got the idea to do animation, um, which I'd wanted to do, but I never thought of doing as that as a way to get into comedy, then I thought, well, this is great. I, I don't need to, I can do this all myself. I don't need to you know, convince a bunch of people to get in front of a camera and do this and that. I can just do the whole thing on my own, so. I work for a living, and I mean real work, not writing down gobbledygook. I have a hard time saying I'm either a Democrat or a Republican. It just doesn't feel good. I was definitely raised, my parents were very liberal. Um, then, I don't know, certain things started to, you know, I mean, a lot, for a lot of people, that's kind of almost a religion to them. And right-wing stuff is too, you know, so uh, I try to not be part of any of that. Um, I suppose I've become a, uh, interested in, you know, smaller government kind of thinking. Uh, it, that sort of happens when, you know, I think you, you know, when you build your own thing, when you do do your own thing and then suddenly you're getting penalized left and right. You, you know, that, that kind of can change you. If you got a business, that, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. I don't ever want to be one of those people that uses my whatever fame or whatever level of that notoriety I have from, from what I do in comedy to try to go into politics. I just, I'm just like... I don't feel like I'm qualified. It kind of bugs me when people in Hollywood will use that, you know, their, you know, their, their audience that they've gained through that to try to put out a political message when they have no idea what they're talking about. King of the Hill, Hank was definitely, you know, I saw as sort of a, I don't know, like populist kind of like, you know, a guy who's like just trying to do his thing and just all these government and all these other weird things of the modern world. Are, it, that was always the fun of it, is, is um, just all these things just kind of poking at him, you know? I live in the real world where men sell propane and propane accessories. I, I definitely, uh, I, remember, <laughs> I remember popping in a VHS when Alex Jones was on uh, cable access. It was you and two other guys and somewhere I, I I can't find it anymore, but I, I think I labeled the tape Three Dales. <laughs> you were kind of the, the more rational one, and then the other two guys were just like, uh, I don't know, was, I, I wish I could find that tape, but um, King of the Hill started with a, a drawing of the four guys that I'd done. I was kind of like 
dabbling in doing panel cartoons, which I never really did at all. I started, I went straight into animation. I didn't draw comic books or anything. And so, so I had the four guys and Dale, I just, something about the way he looked. Originally I had his hat say Smith and Wesson, the first drawing I ever did. I, I just put that on there. I don't know why, just the way he looked. And, and uh, I'd done a first draft of the pilot and then Greg Daniels got involved. And at some point, you know, we had this thing where his wife is, uh, you know, getting it on with this, this Native American healer, and clearly his kid's not his. But so, so we had this idea about that he's just, you know, it's almost probably a subconscious thing. He's like, he's into every conspiracy except the one that's going on in his own house. Nice work, John Redcorn. She didn't suspect a thing. It's almost like his escape, you know, or something. I mean, if, if I, I never psychoanalyzed it that much, but that, I, I kind of feel like that's what uh, that character was about. So he was almost like looking for conspiracies, you know, kind of, uh, and some of them might have something to him. Some of them are crazy. I have read a book. Now, who do you believe, me or Hank? I know Hank, Hank more believable. Dale was, is kind of one of the ones that, you know, probably gives you guys a bad name. <laughs> uh, Johnny Hardwick, who does the voice, I don't know, you may even know him. I, he, he, um, he had a few, like, he, he had a few kooky theories of his own, and sometimes we would work those in. I mean, there, there was one line he said that, he's talking about something, and it ended with him saying, something that they're doing, and corn is next. A French study that was just released finds rats that are fed genetically engineered corn suffered from tumors and severe organ damage. This is the first study that's looking at the effects on rats of eating genetically modified foods over their lifetimes. They gave the rats the genetically modified corn. They gave them the genetically modified corn with the herbicide that the corn is used with. On Dale, it was... I had to do some convincing to get them to let Johnny Hardwick do the voice. I mean, he, was, he wasn't anybody famous at all. He was one of the people we hired as a writer. But it just sounded right to me. Ended up being my favorite character, really, on the show as far as, well, just for a while, you know, as far as the voice and the drawing clicking. And, but, I mean, they had all kinds of celebrities they were pitching. It hardly ever works when you just get, like, oh, let's get this famous person and this person to draw it, and then you have something that just doesn't makes sense, which is a lot of, why a lot of shows fail. Ah! Squirrel tactic! Ah! Okay, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which definitely influenced a lot of what I do, because Beavis and Butthead, to me, is kind of set in a sort of like eastern New Mexico, west Texas type environment, you know, where everything is just sort of, people are bored, um, teenagers are bored, and there's like, it's nothing to do, it's hot. Um, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. And uh, so that was definitely an influence on Beavis and Butthead. Although, you know, uh, I don't think I've ever told this story, but so my grandfather on my mom's side lived with us and he died when I was I think in junior high and like 76, whatever. And he, um, we found out he had a, a uh, 16 millimeter Bolex camera that was there. And I was like, wow, okay, there's a camera in this house. And <laughs> so I waited, I waited like a good two or three months before I, you know, after he passed away to say, hey, could I borrow granddad's camera maybe? And uh, she said, no. And then like I waited another six months and no. Waited like a year, no. So I, that's when I was, I thought, well, okay, maybe I'm just gonna buy one. And then I looked into how much they cost and just couldn't, couldn't pull it together. Years later when I was, uh, like I say, like 26 and I started, got the idea again to try doing animation, I ended up buying the same exact camera because it turns out that's the perfect camera to single frame and shoot animation on. And um, finished my first animated short, first couple, ended up getting them on like Comedy Central and stuff. Sent a tape to my mom, and uh, she said, I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, you probably don't remember. Your grandfather had a Bolex camera. I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> I was like, no, I remember. <laughs> I was like drooling over the idea of just being able to get my hands on it, you know, for, but it all worked out. But uh, yeah, it was kind of, in, in a way, it was probably good because it kind of, 
by the time I was able to actually do it, I was just, it had been a fantasy. It sounds weird, but it was like a fantasy of mine for so long to, to do animation. And so when I finally did, I mean, I really, you know, I didn't take it for granted when I had the opportunity to do it. So probably was a good thing, actually. Y'all got that in there? Large fries, pie, large coffee? Uh... Like Beavis and Butthead, um, I'll get asked a lot if that's based on anybody specific, and it's not. There's no, it's not like that was that person, that was that person. Um, it's just started out as drawings, and then, but but definitely like there's little bits and pieces from all kinds of people in there, you know. Well, I was like that when I was drawing. <laughs> a lot of us were, yeah. I mean, it's a, li a little bit of his like me and my brother, but not, I mean, we weren't. You know, we got good grades and we were, but some of these people are really intelligent too. There was a guy who's now, he's now a professor, I won't say his name, but he, he's one of these guys, like I would see him in the hallway. I think this is, the laugh, I don't even know, the laugh came from, I had just written down, ha, 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 on, kind of on the, it started out as a storyboard. It was the first time I'd animated something where I was, Usually I would start with the voice and then do the drawing. This one I started with a drawing and I didn't know what they would sound like. And um, I just drawn ha 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 on there. Um, years later I realized it might, there's a Mimi Pond cartoon that, um, and I've become friends with her on Facebook now, but she, uh, where she had a guy going, a weirdo on a bus doing that. And I think that might have been in the back of my head. But I, I started doing that laugh and I was kind of like going like this is reminding me of something didn't think about it till probably two years into the show that it was there was a guy at my high school who would just he was uh, really smart stoned all the time but he would just you'd see him in the hallway and I would always see him when the hallway was empty and he'd just start like he's one of these guys that he'd start going hey Mike he just always had this laugh it was different than butthead laugh but it was that thing of just kind of <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> and so when I was do, when I would do the voice, I would just kind of do the, <laughs> and I would and I would get I would be doing it sort of to get into character to get the voice sounding right, and then I'd go, well, that kind of sounds funny that he's just laughing all the time <laughs> anyway. And then I, and then I realized later it was probably in the back of my head because of this guy who used to just kind of talk like that. But it's there's a lot of that little bits and pieces of people. <laughs> there was Beavis, the Beavis laugh, there was a guy who was, uh, was actually in calculus class and he was a really smart guy. He's uh, now a nuclear engineer. I hope he doesn't figure out who he is <laughs> that I'm talking about him. But he, uh, he kind of was always like, we had a hot teacher which was unheard of back then. She was a former Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Uh, anyway, he would get really excited and he just like, he was biting his lip all the time and just kind of going like, <coughs> <coughs> like laughing at everything she said. So I started, I started out Beavis uh, doing the spastic laugh like that. And then around like, yeah, around like season two, I started getting like where, I don't even know if I can do it. And I'd get into the higher register. The, uh, I was, I'd get into this like kind of higher register of like, where he's like kind of going, <coughs> 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 I can't, I have to warm up to it, but I, I started out with that laugh and then I just kind of made his voice sound like the laugh, just like raspy, you know. The animated shows that have really taken off are when somebody, it's usually, it's usually the person who's animating it doing the voice, which is other than The Simpsons, but I mean, The Simpsons, the voices and the characters just match. They're really well done. But like, you know, you look at like Family Guy or South Park or Ren and Stimpy, it's like, you know, somewhere in those guys' heads, it's like the, it just, it makes sense. That voice, those voices sound like they come out of those characters. And I think, I think that clicks on Beavis and Butthead too, especially. Now I'd say Beavis and Butthead probably. That's probably the thing I'm most proud of. I think probably the best thing I've done. Um, there were moments of uh, making office space where I thought this is like the, what I was born to do, but then I think it's probably Beavis and Butthead. I mean, King of the Hill probably overall is uh, overall the best thing I've done, but uh, Beavis and Butthead, like some of it, there's about a third of it that's not that great because we were, we were cranking them out so fast at the beginning of that show. I mean, it was just like, 
MTV just going as many of them as you can make. It's on every day. There's no quality control. They didn't know how to produce a show. Nobody did. It was a train wreck. But so I ended up the episodes I liked. I ended up spending all my time on, and those ones I think are great. That's are probably the best stuff I've done. But um, and the new Beavis and Buttheads I think are as good as as good or better than a lot of the old ones. But um, King of the Hill overall is probably like a good, good, more, um, less spotty, like just, you know, good quality, consistent. <laughs> now it's extinct. <laughs> you know, I grew up very liberal parents, like thinking gun control is the way to go. You know, it's that Michael Moore movie, that was Bowling for Col Columbine, kind of, actually made me go the other, made me think like, I mean, he, he's not trying to, that's not the effect he wanted, I don't think, but he's like kind of, that movie kind of makes you think, no, gun control is a bad idea. I mean, to me, if you look at it, like, I don't think that's what he's trying to, to do at all, but like, he mentions Canada in there, and he says, you know, there's lower crime there, and same people own guns, and so, I, I don't know. I own guns, um, it's, uh, I think if you look at it statistically, you actually are safer. <laughs> I got me a couple AKs, some sawed-offs, 25 9 millimeters, and a couple of ground-to-airs. I got a fort up in the hills, virtually impenetrable, and enough supplies to outlast a 30-year standoff. I know this because, okay, so 1993, Beavis and Butthead, the series, came out, and gun crimes have gone down since... <laughs> since Beavis and Butthead came out. But what's interesting is that nobody talks about, no, no one wants statistics. I, like, I actually went to, I actually took graduate probability and statistics classes. That was what, I was gonna become a math teacher before all this Beavis stuff happened. But um, when I was getting blamed for all this like downfall of youth, that whole time crime was going down in almost every category from the time. Be I mean, if you really wanted to make a correlation, you could say Beavis and Butthead is saving the world. But that's stupid. That, do that really doesn't make any sense. But it makes more sense than saying this particular thing happened and this particular ha thing happened. You know, but, n but really, like, statistically, there's n no correlation. All right. Who are you? CIA? FBI? ATF? Yeah, there's that map where it's just like almost county by county where gun control, it, it's, it's not doing any good. It's like there's higher crime rates where there's gun control, lower where there isn't. I mean, it's just like county by county. I mean, you can't, I think because I have this science background, I just, you look at that and you go, you know, that's, it's kind of ridiculous. As much as, you know, those bumper stickers might have been run into the ground, I mean, it's, it's true, it's like, I, I would be all for it if, it if it was effective, but it's, I haven't seen anything that shows it's effective, you know? Well, Mao said political power goes out of the barrel of a gun. What does Hank Hill say about, <laughs> about disarming people? <laughs> it is the right of all Americans, as Cotton has taught me, to own a gun, even though I'm not so good at shooting them. A Japanese machine gun blew my shins off in WW2. I loved it. <laughs> it was good to see somebody yelling at Pierce Morgan. <laughs> you Listen, accuse me of attacking the Second Amendment of the Constitution. I want to get people off pills that the insert says will Alex, make you commit suicide and Alex, kill people. Alex, let's get about to the Second Amendment. I want to blame Alex, the real culprit. Alex, suicide pills. Alex, mass murder pills. Okay, let me ask you one question. It was interesting, though, the uh, the the way it seemed to be spun on all these websites. There's all these websites now that. Um, have a bunch of hipsters on him who will just kind of like kind of play a clip and grin and chuckle about it and that, that's how I saw it I can't remember what it was on I was thinking hey right on Alex go for it <laughs> well and everything you were saying was true too I mean the, the clip that I saw because you, you yeah you're talking about yeah Hitler took the guns Stalin took the guns Mao took the guns Fidel <laughs> And if you try to take our guns, 1776 will commence again. If you try to take our firearms, doesn't matter how many lemmings you get out there on the street begging for them to have their guns taken. We will not relinquish them. Do you understand? Something like that. I can't, I, you know, I used to do you really well. I can't, like, it was the, 
uh, what was the water filter commercial you used to do? Or what, what the, um, it's been, it's been a while. You should, you'd think I'd have it down now though. I was just like hanging out with you last night. <laughs> Look at these headlines. IRS targeted Tea Party groups for scrutiny. Searching words like Patriot, Tea Party. That does scare me. I think I'm just going to make sure to not use the words Tea Party or Constitution in any of my work. <laughs> That's pretty evil. I won't, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, well, it's, they're, they're calling it uh, the constitutional restrictions or whatever they referred to it as. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that actually is scary. That, uh, yeah, that, that's going to make me listen to some more Alex Jones. <laughs> come on, I want to see it, I want to see it. Yeah, come on, Stuart, do it. <laughs> Well, if I was to get uh, heavy and deep on it, I think the one thing that's made me tick or makes me, I mean, other than just wanting to try to be funny, it tends to be, um, and I, I didn't, I don't overanalyze, but then, you know, when you do this long enough, you do analyze. I think what it is is uh, probably, I think a lot of us are just kind of, out of sync with the way the world is right now, you know? Like the way the modern world, we're not, we're not prepared for it all the time. And there's a lot of stuff that's messed up about it. And I think that's where a lot of my comedy comes from. It's like things that, um, you know, anything from being stuck in a cubicle to being stuck in classrooms that you don't belong in, those kind of things. I think that I get a lot of material out of that. I gotta get out of here. I think I'm gonna lose it. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> when I started doing animation, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to get rich. I wasn't trying to get, I mean, it did not seem like I could get rich off that. I thought, I, I really just, it's just like a desire to um, just express something that's hard to describe. And if I could describe it, I would probably be more of just a flat out writer or something like that. And so a lot of this stuff is like, you know, it's always very hard to describe Beavis and Butthead to people who just ask if they haven't seen it. I never set out to say I'm going to be a satirist, but that's definitely what I mean. I, I've always, the very first thing I animated was the uh, cartoon called Office Space. It was before Dilbert and it was like, Milton at his cubicle and the boss, and it was, um, it was, uh, I, I wanted to do just a series of office characters because, you know, when I, when I grew up, it was a little, like, I'm 50, so, like, an office job was considered a good job. Like, you, it's like, oh, good, you don't have to work construction, okay? You, and then when I first got in an office, I had a temp job before I was an engineer, and I was just, like, going, God, this is torture. I mean, there's a woman answering the phone the same way next to me all day long. I'm alphabetizing in my sleep. <laughs> I'm just like... Corporate accounts payable, Nina speaking. Just a moment. Corporate accounts payable, Nina speaking. Just a moment. And then, kind of, and then that kind of sick feeling of like, oh, all these years of thinking this is a good job and this is what it is. Oh my God, what am I, what's gonna happen to me, you know? Next Friday is Hawaiian shirt day. So, you know, if you want to, go ahead and uh, wear Especially back then, when I started out, a lot of what Hollywood was putting out just was really not in touch with the way most Americans feel. It was very, like, coming from, I mean, most people in Hollywood, honestly, that I mean, still are, like, from pretty wealthy families, usually, and don't, don't seem to have ever had to really you know, come up from the bottom and struggle. I think it's still that way. But so I, I think a lot of it was like, like when I started doing this stuff, you know, about cubicle life was like just to kind of say, hey, I, has anyone else felt like this when they're stuck in a cubicle, you know? And has anyone else noticed that, that sometimes teenagers look really deranged and stupid? You know, it's, it's, that, it's that kind of thing of like wanting to kind of point something out that 
maybe no one else has pointed out. A lot, that's a lot of it, I think. When I did that first Office Space cartoon, which was just a two-minute homemade crappy little short, I mailed out VHS tapes of that, just called Information, and I got so many calls, and I think a lot of people saw it as something very fresh and different, you know? I used to have my own stapler, too, and then when I moved back, they made me give back my stapler. And, and But Bill told me I'm supposed to have a stapler, so and until I'm told different, I'm just going to take a stapler. And if they make me give it back, I'll, I'll just, I'll set the building on fire. Oh, hello, Milton. What's happening? Um, I'm going to need you to go ahead and move your desk again. So, uh, well, if you could go ahead and just get it as far back into that corner as possible, that'd be terrific. So, Idiocracy, I had the idea for it. Um, actually, when I was writing the Beavis and Butthead movie, it was just kind of the seed of the idea when I, I was thinking about just the way evolution works and thinking like, well, wait, there's no predators now. So, it started, it started with that, but then I was actually uh, in line with my daughters, um, I think it was in 2001, at Disneyland at the teacups ride. And, um, you know, it was in the summer and uh, my daughters were little at the time. And, and along comes a woman, like, there's a woman behind me who had had an altercation with this other woman. And they both have their kids in strollers and they just start going off. <laughs> Kick your ass. <laughs> and I'm like, with my kids and like thinking, this isn't what Disney had in mind here. You know, and, and uh, this was in 2001. So it was, it was the summer right before. September 11th. So I was also thinking, you know, what if, what if the movie 2001, instead of being this, you know, the monolith and everything being pristine and advanced, what if it was like the Jerry Springer show and giant Walmarts? What if that had been that movie 2001? So I kind of was thinking like, just take that chart from when that was made to now and project it out and just like see where that would go. And the years passed and mankind became stupider at a frightening rate. So Fox, I still um, owed them, part of my overall deal was uh, to write two movies for them, so I'd done Office Space. And in order to do something else for anybody else, I needed to burn that one off. And I sort of, I kind of thought no one would make it. I thought it'd just be fun to write. I'd just start from there, you know? This was, like, it was making me laugh. I just, after the Disneyland experience, I just started writing stuff down and ended up co-writing, getting someone to work with me, this guy, Aton Cohen, and we got through a first draft pretty quickly and gave it to Fox, and then no one kind of wanted to make it, and I was like, well, okay, well, it wasn't going to be huge budget, but it was going to be something. It was going to cost, you know? 23 million or something. And, uh, and it just sat there, and I'm trying to remember how, and then uh, Luke Wilson wanted to do it, and I was like, okay, then I started to see it again. Then I went back and rewrote it, kind of with him in mind, and just, um, just rewrote it, because it, it needed to be better anyway. Um, and we had in the script this whole thing about the Starbucks, and, because I remember actually driving on I-35 it was like something tan. It was a tanning salon. It said exotic tan for men. And I, I had no idea that tanning salons had turned into, you know, hand job places or whatever it was. And so I was just talking to friends of mine and going, wow, I wonder what's next. I mean, is it going to be like Starbucks or what? And uh, so we had that in the script. And when it was in pre-production, I was, you know, they run it by legal. And I'm going, Man, I don't know how I'm going to come up with something better than the Starbucks thing because it, 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 it's not funny if it's not a, a known place, you know. And so, legal, an interesting thing happened. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how <laughs> this happened, but they, but they said, um, well, they said no, and then they said, well, you know, I just said, so what? Can it be satire? And this, and they said, well, what would help us is if you didn't just pick on them if it was a bunch of companies. I was like. <laughs> Okay, so then that's how we ended up with that whole red light district in there in the movie where it's like, I think it's like H&R Block adult tax return with release and like there's like, there's like a Pollo Loco or Pollo Baracho adult chicken, I don't know. <laughs> we, 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 and, then, and then we just did everything, Costco, uh, I don't know what happened. I, I, at some point I'm sure somebody got really flipped out, but I, I was 
shielded from all that. A similar thing happened on Office Space, but Idiocracy, I've been getting so much love for it like in the last two years. Um, what you're saying is that you want us to put water on the crops. Yes. Water. Like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but, but yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that's in there maybe is starting to happen, you know, now instead of 500 years from now <laughs> when it's set. And that's the Secretary of Education. It's kind of stupid when his President Camacho's stepbrother still does a pretty good job, eh? Yeah. It was supposed to take place during a drought. It was the rainiest summer ever in Austin. We were just having to kill grass everywhere in the background. Um, but they didn't really give it a release. There was a contractual obligation. They had to put it in like 12 theaters, and that's all they did, I think. In fact, if you called Movie Phone, they didn't even, it was listed under Untitled Mike Judge Project. It was, they didn't even bother. It went straight from what it was on the contract to Movie Phone. They didn't even put idiocracy in there. Dwayne Elizondo Camacho, five-time Ultimate Smackdown champion, porn superstar, and president of the United States had called a special summit with the smartest man in the world. So you smart, huh? You know, no. I thought your hair would be bigger. Could look like a peanut. <laughs> Let's get you sworn in. Well, I, I do know what they told me, which, and I finished the movie long, uh, at least like, I want to say like nine months before it came out. I was, it was in the can. I'd finished the mix. I, I'd turned the whole thing in. Um, what they told me was it didn't test very well, which a lot of movies don't. You know, Office Space didn't. Whoa. I think I just figured something out, Beavis. <laughs> what? <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> yeah, me. You really suck. <laughs> me. This sucks more than anything that has ever sucked before. The way movie testing works, they have these sheets and it'll, it says uh, excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor. For it to count at all, it has to be excellent or very good, I think. So if, it, if they say good, that's just a zero for you. So a lot of people, if it's a weird movie, they'll go, oh, it was good. They won't say very good. You know, so we would get like a 70% very good and excellent, which sounds, that's considered a horrible score. I'm fixing to commensurate this trial here. We gonna see if we can come up with a verdict up in here. Now, why you think you done it? Okay, number one, your honor. Just look at him. <laughs> <laughs> he talks like a fine too. <laughs> and B, we've got all this like, Evidence. This is what I remember. They said, said, look, you know, uh, it didn't test well. We can't, they, they made some horrible trailers for it. And I was glad they didn't put those out because they weren't going to, they weren't very good. And then they just said, you know, look, we, uh, um, we don't want to spend a lot of money promoting it. And they dumped the movie. But, but I mean, they said Why that. Why do you think that is? When it came out, it got a lot, it almost got, it almost, Maybe they were doing something right because it got a lot of attention. I didn't do any press for it. I ended up getting my picture in Time magazine <laughs> without ever doing an interview because they were doing stories about like what's up with this movie? Why you know why are they putting it out in twelve theaters and not talking about it, not putting a title on it? And so it ended up getting some press. People liked it, um, but it's interesting. Like now, I mean, it's become the the term idiocracy has become. There was a guy in the L.A. Times who wrote an article like a year ago about and cited all the other articles that it's in and um, I don't know maybe just since since it came out in 2006 everyone's gotten stupider and <laughs> but Brando's got what plants crave it's got electrolytes Symbols are powerful, and the globalists have hijacked the symbols of America. They've turned them into their own symbols. Well, we are restoring the idea of the true republic, not the counterfeit globalist empire, by promoting the icon George Washington and others. That's why we're rolling out on a 100% made in America line of incredible pro-liberty apparel. We are repopularizing liberty, we are helping fellow Americans rediscover what made this country great. 
We are the spirit of 1776. We are 1776 worldwide. We are all brothers and sisters in arms in the animating contest of liberty in the long march towards humanity's ultimate destiny of freedom. Visit MadeIn1776.com today and vote with your dollars to promote truly made in America, high quality products and promote the ideals of liberty. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com.